security studies. Um, we're so pleased to welcome Pablo Oriana um, today, and he's a lecturer in international relations at the Department of War Studies. He's doing fascinating research. His talk today is based on a book chapter, but he does have a book forthcoming. So we'll have to watch, um, watch out for that virtual space. Can't wait to read the book. Um, so Pablo himself, like I said, is a lecturer in international relations with war studies here. His research focuses on how diplomatic communication constitutes the representation, representations upon which policy itself is actually made. He has published on diplomacy, North African politics, European affairs, nationalism and identity politics, art history, as well as reviews, essays and features on contemporary art in peer reviewed um, and, and less formal publications. So his um, Pablo already um, is making a significant contribution to the field as an emerging scholar and a person to follow and watch. So today, again, Pablo is going to be talking about a book chapter that he's uh, worked on. Uh, the brief abstract is, before the beginning of the so-called Arab Spring, Libya was considered a vital partner in the war on terror, uh, one that was um, constructively re-engaging with the international community. And over a few weeks in 2011, however, the regime came to be described as rogue, and um, predictions were made about the madman Gaddafi, um, you know, perpetrating genocide in Benghazi. What then brought about this spectacular turnaround in US perceptions of Libya in the early 2010s is really what, what Pablo's chapter um, considers. Researching how diplomacy describes and analyzes the identity of international actors allows for two new perspectives of relevance to diplomatic practice and analysis. Firstly, his chapter talks about how detailed analysis of diplomatic communication text reveals how specific descriptive descriptions work, how it functions, and what ideas, narratives, and links it depends upon. And secondly, analysis of how representations of identities and their context are constituted reveals the dynamics of knowledge production of a um, specific institution. So this allows for a constructive critique of information management, analysis, prioritization, and role of dominant and sometimes global policy priorities. I will not say any more to give away. I'll leave some in suspense for, for Pablo to talk in much more detail about the innovative methodology um, he applies to these texts and why people concerned with broader uh, issues around global diplomacy um, statecraft and all of that really need to pay attention to his analysis. So Pablo's agreed to talk for about 30 minutes and then we'll open the floor to the audience for further engagement and commentary. So without further ado, Pablo, I'm going to hand the virtual floor over to you. Thank you so much, Amanda. And most of all, thank you so much for organizing this series. I think it's incredible to have this series of talks that then is realized as a series of short publications in AI. I think there's an incredible achievement and a wonderful way for our department's new work and ongoing work to keep influencing policy conversations. Um, hello everyone else, thank you so much for coming. I see some old friends here, former students, current students, absolutely wonderful to see you all. Um, so I suppose that for quite some time now, for about a decade, I have lived obsessed with one question. How do we know who we're talking to? Fine, we know that we did war in Vietnam to fight communism. Great. We started a war in Malaya to fight communism. Great. We started another war in so and so place to fight terrorism and the like. Fine. But this implies that we know who we're talking about, who we're talking to, and what they are, and their intentions. Really, these policy decisions are made on the basis of an understanding of someone, an actor, non state actor, a state actor, a revolutionary actor, one of a variety. And so, I've long been obsessed with, well, how do we know who we're talking to? Because we have this huge policy, policy decisions. In my last book, The Road to Vietnam, we went to fight war in Vietnam to fight communism and in fact stop the Vietnamese, you know, realizing a communist takeover of Southeast Asia, which was Stalin's plan. Well, how do we know that the communist rebels were not really anti-colonial, they were communists? So I developed a method during my doctorate and developed it since, that essentially looks to see how this knowledge is built within institutions. Yeah, especially I've looked at mistakes that in hindsight is easy to see that terrible mistakes were made like the Vietnam War where the Pentagon Papers themselves 
essentially acknowledged we misidentified who we were talking about so badly. And in fact, we got dragged into it by the French. In time, I came to see that this is something that happens quite a lot to American and British and French diplomacy, where for all their influence, there are policy spaces where their influence and their policy is essentially deeply influenced by other actors and often very unexpected actors that do not have the classical attributes of great power and influence. Um, the second poorest country in the entire world, Mali, essentially defined Sahel security policy for the United States for about 10 years. Same with Morocco and Western Sahara with the culmination a couple of months ago of the American recognition of the occupation of the world's last colony. And so the focus of my work is essentially a method where I start from a big policy decision. In this case, Gaddafi. Gaddafi is evil. He's going to genocide the whole country. His opponents want to set up a democratic uh, system of governance and we should help them. The decision essentially at the Security Council and um, our colleagues, um, Adler Nissen and Pouliot wrote a brilliant paper called uh, Power in Practice, where they interviewed hundreds of diplomats involved in the negotiations that led to the National, um, to the Security Council resolution that essentially allowed for the um, intervention in Libya. But I was interested in the American side of it, because we know quite a lot about the French side of it. Sarkozy, as we now know, personal obsessions with making Gaddafi shut up because he paid for his second run for the presidency. But how about the American side? There is quite little knowledge, and the problem is that the character of Clinton here has made things very complicated, of course, because she was a presidential candidate a few years later. And so I applied my method. Uh, and so my method to understand how diplomacy produces knowledge about specific actors essentially consists of three steps. The first defines the data for analysis on a conceptual basis, and I call it the diplomatic moment. This is based on the insight that diplomacy is a especially textual practice. Everything is written in diplomacy. It's hilarious. It's the most textual practice imaginable. Dear sir, I have carried out so-and-so Dimash to Amanda and handed in the letter you gave me on the 9th March. Everything is recorded to death. Um, I, I have no end of hilarious anecdotes, of which one is a favorite, and that is after Churchill met uh, Stalin for the first time in 1941 in Moscow. They couldn't agree on how to cooperate against the Nazis. Um, and after three meetings, Stalin invites Churchill for a personal um, dinner at his apartment in the Kremlin. And after apparently seven bottles of Georgian wine and an enormous amount of brandy, of which they were both very, very fond of, they came to an agreement. Now, the next day, we've got the hilarious image of Churchill throwing up into a bucket on the flight back to England. Very, very long and very, very shaky propeller plane flight whilst trying to dictate to his two assistants, and, and um, Alec Doug Douglas Hume is the person I, I, I kind of looked into for this, essentially trying to recall what the agreement was and put it in text because Douglas Hume, foreign uh, assistant to the foreign secretary, had to write this down so that it could enter the policy structure so that we knew that this was the decision so that it could be sent to Stalin for him to say, yes, that's what we agreed on. And then both foreign policy establishments get on with it. Yeah, because there's a big difference is that did we agree on 10,000 tanks or as many as we could per month? That makes a big difference, a very, very big difference. And what is the basis of our agreement? And so everything has to be written down in diplomacy, which provides with a fantastic opportunity to see exactly what they were saying at the time. We don't have to depend on their recollections or their opinions or the subsequent politics of events like the Vietnam War, full of regret, or the war on terror and so on and so forth, where everyone essentially, if you interview them now, tells you, yeah, but we were trying to save the world, you know, Pablo, like, you know, don't, don't, don't place this burden on us. It's like, no, I'm interested in understanding how, at that time, in the 2000s, we came to understand this context in this way, or this actor in this way. And so I use this insight, the diplomatic moment, the fact that all diplomatic knowledge has essentially to be submitted into an institutional process, a canon. And that is bureaucratically very flawless for us researchers, because of course, all diplomatic text is an official submission into centralized systems. In Britain, it's called the DIPTEL system, diplomatic cables in the United States and so on and so forth, which this formalized system means that at the archive, it's fantastic because you can see the entire chain 
of knowledge production from the guy on the ground saying, I've just spoken to so-and-so tribal leader, and he says this and that, all the way to his political officer in, in the mission, and then to the ambassador, and then sent to the State Department, the State Department analyzes it, and eventually one line from that, if that ends up with the Assistant Secretary of State, and then the Deputy Secretary of State, and then finally maybe the Secretary of State and the Grand Heights of the White House. And so it's a process of knowledge production where Amanda's a uh, cable from her mission in Hanoi gets summarized, written down, a few quotes taken out, or maybe in, ignored altogether if it's not considered relevant. And that too is part of my research. Why are some bits of information more relevant than others at any given time? And so once I have this body of text that I call the cascade of knowledge production from the, your guys on the ground all the way to the to the president and then back down because of course these institutions go back to the diplomats and say oh i love hearing about that i want to know more about terrorists in the desert or no i don't care about that don't, don't tell me more about that and so once i have this entire body of text going both ways both governing knowledge production and doing knowledge production i analyze texts in extreme detail um, often in my publications, I only give you analysis of two or three texts that set as examples, but as I do the research, I analyze most texts in extreme detail. A type of analysis that Foucault called archaeology is essentially um, a very extreme type of discursive analysis that I structure like Roland Barthes does, which is essentially on a formalized commentary so that it makes all the texts, and, and sorry, the analysis of all the texts comparable to one another. Once I understand how a text works, works, I have two crucial bits of insight. One, how does it represent? It tells us, for instance, that Ho Chi Minh is a communist stooge. He's of the Stalin school. He's Asian. Yeah? This bits of representation, it gives me all the, essentially, it reveals the architecture of a description. And descriptions have architecture. Yeah? That's the most important thing. And no representation is made of its own. I've been speaking of representations rather than identity, not because I don't think identity doesn't matter but rather because identity is an outcome of representation. Representation, if you read your, shall we say, post structuralist canon, like Said and, and company, can be taken apart into a representation of space, does of people, it's a very, very powerful set of ideas. Time, they're backward. Um, race, of course, they're Oriental or they're North African and so on and so forth. And norms, they're evil, they're good. What they want is right, what they want is not right, and so on and so forth. And so I take apart these representations to understand how they work and what are the conditions of possibility? What makes it possible to believe that Gaddafi really was gonna slaughter everyone in Libya that did not agree with him? What makes this believable? What is the structure of this representation? I would ask myself. Understanding this allows me two things. On the one hand, it allows me to confidently understand how Gaddafi was described, but secondly, Understanding the architecture of a representation means that I can follow it across thousands, endless numbers of texts. Here, really, the only challenge is manpower to go through um, all the di diplomatic documentation. It's quite laborious and slow research to do, but fascinating because you see these representations evolve. Maybe Amanda gets involved and a few words get taken out and others get put in. Um, and this second step of my methodology is called, um, broadly speaking, in post-structuralist tradition, a genealogy. And mine is a Nietzschean genealogy in specific terms because it goes backwards. I start from, in this case, the Security Council resolution and go back to Obama, Sarkozy's and Cameron's speeches. And then I go backwards asking the question, well, how do we get here? Yeah. And so <clears throat> the documents reveal themselves. That's what makes this, this method so very empirical because the documents are telling you, I read this report from Amanda. Well, you go and find the report from Amanda. And the good thing about diplomatic communication is that it will always be properly referenced. They're even more hysterical about it than us academics. Everything is referenced in extreme detail. If you're lucky enough to be playing around with the WikiLeaks, you actually click on the reference and it takes you to the other cable that is referencing, right? And so you can chase knowledge production wherever it may go. Wherever the representation came from, you can find it because it empirically reveals itself in this method. Now, enough about the method. What does this tell us about Libya? Because the interesting thing here is that we may well, as policymakers, have made a very terrible mistake in Libya. The, the, the Libyan uh, intervention was essentially predicated on the certainty that Gaddafi will slaughter everyone that did not agree with him, and the majority of the population was thought. The certainty that the rebels were a democratic, Western-looking, modern, in Western terms, type of rebel that wanted to establish regimes very much like ours. And crucially, the assumption that this was not 
an Islamist event, which had been the focus of American foreign policy for the previous 12 years, to be honest. Um, so this is an important question. In fact, the representation, if you look at the Security Council resolutions, was very much a simple binary. We've got this madman, using those words, madman, genocidal maniac that will kill everyone, versus freedom fighters, Democrats, uh, non-radicals, American freedom loving, Obama spoke of. And so this seems like an obvious choice to make, but this was a very contested choice, uh, representation of the State Department, and one that many of America's allies did not agree with either. And there are many, many contradictions in here. One is, of course, and the most obvious, taking Gaddafi's word as, as at face value. That's ridiculous. We had spent the previous 40 years not trusting a single word that Gaddafi said. Gaddafi was notoriously prone to hyperbole. He was going to blow up all of Europe at one point, proposed that Switzerland should be split up and that he would help pay for it and things like that. Taking Gaddafi at his word was a ridiculous choice because, I mean, if you had taken Gaddafi at his word in the 70s and 80s, he was going to nuke all of Western Europe and, you know, that didn't happen and so on. This time, we chose to take him at his word when he said, I'm going to slaughter all of my enemies. And this is itself a contradiction because we have got thousands of cables from before this intervention where American diplomats are telling American politicians, listen, Gaddafi is very extreme when he speaks, but he wants to do business with us. So we, we had an understanding that Gaddafi was prone to hyperbole. His death for us North African experts um, stemmed the flow of the best quotations ever for papers and talks, unfortunately, because he was very, very funny. His dying words were, Obama, son of Africa, you have betrayed, betrayed us. And so taking Gaddafi at his word was a contradiction. But crucially, there were other problems here, assumptions that were essentially not questioned, not tested and assumptions that were contradicted by what the State Department already knew. Because one of the problems with diplomatic knowledge production is very often not not knowing enough, but rejecting knowledge that already exists within the institution. So American diplomats on the ground in Libya had a fairly good idea of what was happening. They knew the groups involved amongst the rebels, including the, the two Al-Qaeda affiliates, the one supported by Qatar and others. They knew quite a lot of detail. Um, and in fact, they. they that there are a couple of cables that try to warn Secretary Clinton that the only groups we think are what they think they are, are basically the old monarchist, monarchist Sinisi sect, which is itself much more religious than American foreign policy would have been comfortable with at the time. And those were the only major groups that were not Islamist at the time, which is a very energetic choice not to see these contradictions. And crucially, in the construction of the case for intervention, we also have a case of a Libyan population that is essentially reduced to a very orientalized, I think, and genderized idea of vulnerability. They will be slaughtered, uh, raping, destruction, genocide, they're unarmed, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, gender is an important marker in all types of representation and analysis, not just identity or gender itself. Gender is a vital marker in all study of representation all, in all contexts, for a very simple reason. Whenever gender emerges, you can be absolutely certain that we're talking about claims on nature. And this is very important. Nationalists are obsessed with gender, not because it's an accessory to their culture war, as many people assume, it's because a claim to nature about race is very much the same ideological engine as a claim to nature about gender. Yeah, your body produces your social role in its color, in its gendering, and in, it, in its social functions as a, as a result. Yeah, and therefore, the, whenever you see gender emerge in a site that is not necessarily nationalist, um, like diplomacy, you are essentially being, this is a bell saying nature, ideas of nature are floating around, ideas of nature are being dealt in here. Uh, and it's not surprising because this intervention was very much written in a similar terms as Blair would have described the intervention in Afghanistan, saving Afghan women from the Taliban, things like that. So that's not to say that Afghan women were not having a hard time under the Taliban, um, but this specific gendered lens actually reveals that there are two other claims of nature happening at the same time. And here we have, I hesitate to call it a neo-colonial claim, but there is definitely an element of quite old fashioned orientalism occurring in particularly how France, Britain and America looked at, described at the situation in North Africa. Um, in the French context, it's very interesting because they appealed back to 1850s ideas of North Africa as barbary, constantly in chaos, and needing European power to be brought to bring it into 
um, into order. Um, if you think that this is not an old, an old story in America, you might want to look at America's first ever non-Western, uh, and I mean Western Hemisphere, non-Western intervention ever, which was an alliance with the Kingdom of Morocco to smash the Barbary pirates. This is only six years after American independence. So the first ever European war was actually against North Africa. Um, and Algeria to be precise, and then France um, used this to invade Algeria afterwards. And so we have a situation where we've got diplomats on the ground providing very, very good thick data that understood the context rather well, understood the groups involved. But then this belies a lot of the, shall we say, the processes inside the State Department, because the information coming from the ground was good. A lot of the analysis was good, if limited, because they only had two analysts of the State Department dedicated to North Africa, but we've got major problems with things that are downright lies. So we have got essentially a co colossal misunderstanding on Salafism in Libya, and a misunderstanding that was very unnecessary, a misunderstanding that was produced essentially by denying the information from America's own diplomats coming up. And here is where Clinton and her own foreign policy establishment really matter. Because if we're gonna ask the how question, my uh, genealogy, my study of the diplomatic communication surrounding the Libya intervention, which is illuminated by WikiLeaks on the one hand, but um, the Podesta emails, the massive leak of Clinton emails from the last presidential campaign in 2016. And though I'm sorry that this did not help her win the election, it was an absolute treat as a researcher to have a look at this diplomatic data 30 years before it would be declassified. Some of it would be declassified. And the interesting thing is that unlike many bits of diplomatic data or other leaks, like WikiLeaks, which include quite little policy elite material, the Clinton leaks had the entire process, but crucially, they had all the private emails at the top, the group of people that were discussing and essentially filtering information as you go along. I'm talking about, for instance, um, Sidney Blumenthal, a very important person in, in, in Clinton's circle, even now, <clears throat> and very influential in, in, in that side of democratic foreign policy in the United States, uh, writing to Clinton, hey, do you want to hear more about this? And she's like, yes, 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 please give me more information. And so these people that were not part of the foreign policy establishment were vital in informing Hillary Clinton about many things. The, the greatest culprit here is Sidney Blumenthal, that essentially turns speculation, press, conspiracy theories, and the thinking of a few of his personal allies into the stream of information that is informing Secretary Clinton. And you will see when this paper uh, is published in New Perspectives on Diplomacy, which is um, a, a, an edited volume coming up, edited by Jack Spence, our very own uh, diplomacy doyen at War Studies. Um, I look in a lot of detail at essentially how a lot of the information was governed. Because really what happened here is a tragic case of Clinton forcing the State Department to tell her what she wanted to hear, to see what they wanted to see. And this was particularly catastrophic in the case of Libya. I mean, it's easy to speak in hindsight of more people have died in the ongoing civil war that, than Gaddafi could ever have killed in 300 years of dictatorship or his own civil war, which was less bloody than the current one, um, even though obviously not nice. But crucially, there is also the influence of Clinton's private network on the work of the State Department. And this is where it gets very interesting, because someone that is vital to this process is right now has just been made national security advisor and is basically the voice of American foreign policy right now. And his name is um, Jake Sullivan. Now, Jake Sullivan was uh, a top State Department official, um, deputy secretary at one point, uh, in the Clinton State Department, and he was in many occasions the link between, shall we say, the, pr the private information and the State Department information. And, and Jake Sullivan had an awkward role where very often he had to process a lot of this information coming from journalists, coming from other sources um, that Clinton was very um, keen on. For, for example, the scholar Anne-Marie Slaughter was extremely influential on this policy making. Um, I used to think much higher of Anne-Marie Slaughter until I saw her emails to Clinton, essentially asking Clinton to lie and say the public needs to see this war as Gaddafi versus freedom fighters. Do not say that they're armed and do not allow any other language. In many ways, this is the opposite of what I do. If, if I study language to understand their politics, this is using language to 
frame the politics in a very, very specific way, in a very, very specific American vision of a country becoming democratic, their own stories seen elsewhere. And in fact, if you read Obama's speech explaining why America would be involved in Libya, it's very much off. We empathize with freedom fighters everywhere else because our own experience was a revolution for freedom. And so there was a choice to see this as the American revolution in many ways, um, even though that was not necessarily the case. Now, at the confluence of this policy making and knowledge production, there was also the rejection of all the contradictions, and there were many. The State Department was very keen to let the Secretary of State know that most of the rebels we knew about, and we knew about in very, very unhappy war on terror uh, Al Qaeda groups. We knew the groups that were being supported by Qatar, which is a major sp sponsor of international Islamic terrorism. We knew the role of the Sinisi. We knew even two aspects that were very heavily ignored by Clinton, by choice, essentially, because we have the email saying, I don't want to hear about this anymore, this is not important. And that is the two big roles that Gaddafi played in the North Africa system over the last 30 years, and about which Clinton was very specifically warned about. The one is nomads. Nomadism is much larger in North Africa than anyone imagines. A huge proportion of the population is nomadic. And a lot of the conflicts that we see emerging in North Africa, the Mali, Western Sahara, and so on, are because of the problem of nomadism not being incompatible with the states created by the colony and the post-colony, and really France splitting the Sahara, most of all. Um, and Gaddafi was vital to containing the most aggressive Tuareg groups. It is no coincidence that only six months after the death of Gaddafi, we have the biggest single Tuareg rebellion in 30 years, which, by the way, is the 16th Tuareg rebellion since 1962. Um, that's how keen they are to leave Mali and the countries constructed by the colony. And crucially, Gaddafi was able to contain them, and Gaddafi had engaged a lot with Western countries in, in containing these groups, containing migration, containing illegal migration into Italy, especially to the point that Gaddafi had become a border guard for Italy in many regards by the late 2000s and, had, and was uh, an enthusiastic collaborator of some of the, shall we say, less humane European programs to keep people out uh, and you know, re retain fortress Europe. Um, the second thing that was ignored was that Gaddafi was actually a key factor in containing Islamic terrorism. We forget that Gaddafi was in many ways, like Saddam Hussein, the equivalent of a communist in the Islamic world. And even though he used religion a lot and wrote about it in his theory of the state, the Green Book, he had a very specific view of Islam that did not allow for groups like Al-Qaeda. And even though only six months before this intervention, the CIA and many other major American institutions were enthusiastically collaborating with Gaddafi, and Gaddafi had, Gaddafi had been a great help in containing Al-Qaeda and Saudi and Qatari sponsored Islamic activity in North Africa. This is another factor that was ignored. And thirdly, and this I find the most tragic, were the overtures that Gaddafi was making privately for peace. Gaddafi had spoken to Frattini, the then Italian Foreign Secretary, and was asking essentially for talks. I'm, I'm not sure this means that he was honest about the talks or that he was going to give up power or give the protesters or, or, or foreign countries what they wanted, but there was more of a willingness to engage than madman doing genocide would suggest. Now, by all means, I'm not defending Gaddafi. There's no need to defend Gaddafi because hindsight really shows us that we may have screwed up worse than Gaddafi. That's why this is a policy question really worth looking at, because if we if we made a context worse than Gaddafi could, then it, we are looking at a very catastrophic mistake, especially in a case like now where it was entirely unenforced, because we had enough diplomatic understanding not to have made this mistake. What I'm essentially saying is that we need methods like these and approaches like this to understand how policy policymakers and knowledge production chose not to see certain things and chose to see others. What, what does this reveal about diplomacy and Libya full stop? And I'll, I'll, I'll leave it for questions. I won't be long. I'll leave it for questions so that then you can ask me more precise questions about the research, perhaps, in the Libyan context. The first lesson is the question we should be asking all the time. Who are we talking to? This is a very old question of diplomacy. Since the beginning of diplomacy, these two first modern diplomatic practitioners, Machiavelli and Cayère, French and Florentine, uh, ministries of foreign affairs respectively in the 1500s were already obsessed with their diplomats writing good reports back because they had to base their policy choices on this. Um, 
this understanding of who we're talking to is deeply fragile because it's so subjective. Like identity, it depends on so many discursive items, so many existing knowledges, existing prejudices, existing ideas like gender, race, and so on, that it is extremely fragile, changing, and subjective. It is nuanced. There are no simple answers to diplomatic knowledge. If there is a simple answer, you should be extremely suspicious. If you get a representation of a war like Gaddafi the Madman versus the Freedom Fighters, one should be deeply suspicious because it lacks the very depth the diplomatic establishments themselves are able to produce. This is the second problem that emerges. A lot of good work is being done by diplomacy. We keep, not, we keep choosing not to read it. We keep choosing not to read the warnings of these dip American diplomats in Libya that were telling us, I'm not sure these rebels are that nice. They just shot at us. Um, you know, maybe we should rethink this. Um, thirdly, the power of politics in entering diplomacy belies our assumptions about a neutral civil service and diplomacy as a permanent, unpolitical and unchanging institution of the state. What I'm trying to say is that politicians have a lot more power to demand that diplomats show them what they want to see than I had imagined before. Very often diplomatic knowledge production, as this is also the case in the Iraq war and the Vietnam war, is turned into, tell me what I want to see. And this is a problem. This is a problem because it, it tells us that maybe we're not reacting, we're producing much events much more than we expect. So maybe the rebellion in Libya, I'm trying to say, was not just seen by diplomacy, it may well have been co-produced by diplomatic knowledge and diplomatic practice. For diplomacy overall, I have five lessons I'm very, very keen to share, especially in the context of AI and speaking about diplomacy more broadly. And, and really, I'm, I'm being a bit of a Nietzschean ass here, because my five lessons are really five critiques that I think needs to be put in our pocket to, to do things better, to do diplomacy better. The first is, as I've been told by countless diplomats, can we please read the work of the diplomats that we're already paying for? Since we're paying these thousands of diplomats all over the world to write reports, let's read what they will do. That might be a good beginning. It's a resource that is already there. I mean, in the British diplomatic system, it's all within a computer um, database. It's searchable. It's a searchable, massive database of old knowledge produced by all British diplomats around the world. It's ridiculous not to use it. It's a total waste. Why the hell are we paying for it, if that is the case? Well, we might be paying for it for the wrong reasons, symbolic reasons, to say that we have three men in Libya, rather than to use the work of these three men in Libya. In other words, we need to take diplomacy more seriously because some of its oldest works, like just collecting information at that level, at the elite level, it's not really espionage as much as I've spoken to the president and his advisor, and between the two, I think they think that. That we need to take a lot more seriously. Um, and this will prevent the problem of simplicity, the problem of simple representations like Gaddafi the madman versus the freedom fighters, because this would add depth. As I, as I always tell my students, precise question means depth and depth means insight. Lesson number two, who produces diplomatic knowledge? Well, mostly diplomats, but who governs it is not. It's the likes of Blumenthal. Blumenthal was a political operator, shall we say. He's a bit of a Dominic Cummings kind of character. He was Hillary Clinton's Dom Dominic Cummings during her campaign against Obama uh, to run for the presidency. And he was so brutal about Obama that when Obama made Clinton Secretary of State, he explicitly demanded that Blumenthal not be employed in any function whatsoever by the State Department. Um, proverbial excrement hits the fan in Libya, and who does Clinton turn to? Blumenthal. In fact, Blumenthal is emailing Clinton almost daily, telling her what is happening, and passing information from his sources and his reading of the situation onto Clinton, and is deeply influential. Um, the letters, you can see Clinton essentially using Blumenthal's language. Um, and another very, very important insight for this is that there are more institutions involved than we expect. Because um, other countries know that we're liable to this, um, there are think tanks, there are other diplomats deeply involved in impacting our knowledge production, in, in this case, America's knowledge production. Um, in fact, North, all North, North African countries and six separate North African rebel 
and insurgent groups have offices for lobbying purposes in Washington and are registered as official lobbyists. Uh, the biggest spender in this regard is Morocco, that is desperate to prove to American policymakers as a modern country, is a, is a democracy, and that Western Sahara should be given to, to Morocco. Um, another lesson on who does diplomatic knowledge production and an expected influence on Clinton was Tony Blair. Do not ever listen to anything Tony Blair has to say, ever. If Tony Blair tells, writes your cable saying you're doing the Lord's work, take the opposite position, complete opposite position. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I make joke of it, but maybe Clinton should by this time have worked out that Tony Blair was not the most insightful advisor to listen to on these issues. Thirdly, this process of knowing who and why we're talking to people is and this is very important. Cynthia Lowe tried to make this point, and I don't think she had a sufficient impact on diplomatic analysis 15 years ago. Because diplomacy, yes, is grand and manly and uniformed, and shall we say, you know, embassy Ferrero Rocher kind of processes, but it's also private, it's also personal. One of the most important places for policymaking around Libya was Clinton's kitchen counter. Her secretary would leave printouts of the most important bits of information. We, we know what Clinton read because Clinton would be sent, say, a newspaper article by Blumenthal, and Clinton, if she liked it, would tell her, her secretary to print it out and leave it on the kitchen counter. And Clinton would spend several hours every early morning reading everything in the pile that her secretary had left on the kitchen counter. This was, this was basically smartphone diplomacy. She would get all of this information and she would forward the bits she liked the most, many of them not from the State Department, to her secretary and say, print them out for me. Um, and so we have these informal domestic spaces and people, women in this case, that are involved much more than we can expect and whose role is not recognized. So for instance, Boumedi was a very, very important young woman that was involved in, in shall we say, Clinton's policymaking overall. There are personal relations. Cynthia and Lowe wrote really well about the wives of officers of diplomats and so on and so forth that have played key roles. This is also retrieved in, in the Power and Practice paper by Adler Neeson and Pouliot, where personal relations often go through structures of gender in, and become elements of diplomacy because diplomacy will deploy everything there is, including personal relations. And crucially, one of the biggest dangers for diplomatic knowledge production, it turns out, is having very strong and or, and or extreme policies. What do I mean by this? Well, for instance, having a very, very radical policy like the war on terror or containment of communism meant that lots of countries were able to say, oh, I'm also fighting terrorism, give me money. In fact, Gaddafi did that. And we rekindled friendship with Gaddafi very much on you help us fight terrorism. And so having big policies, such as the unofficial Clinton, we will support democracy wherever we see it, is itself a problem because wanting to support democracy wherever we see it, in this case, quite literally ended up meaning we will make it look like democracy so that then we can support it. And this is a problem because wanting to see it and seeing it become a constitutive process. And this is just not very good for good diplomacy and good understanding of what is happening on the ground. Big vague strategies, in other words is the fourth lesson. Don't have big, vague strategies, global containment of communism, global war on terror, because it's too vague. Everyone and their mums can be fighting those. And five, final lesson, and this is an, should be an easy one, but it's not, is do not allow old persisting problems that are recognized and are known in diplomacy to shape understanding of actors. This is very vague. But let, to be more specific, I'm talking about race, orientalism, and gender. Let me give you an example. In 1947, one of the most successful arguments of French diplomacy to persuade America to help France fight the Vietnamese rebels was, listen, I, we understand that you're very empathetic to anti-colonial movements. So are we. We want Vietnam to be free one day. They're just not ready yet. But you must understand, these rebels could never have fought like this, establish a massive insurgency and almost defeat the French military on their own. They're Oriental. They've been an inferior race for hundreds of years because the heat has slowed down their brains. They are apolitical people that only want to eat rice and live until the next day. They would never have done this without a Soviet plot. Put it this way, I'm quoting French Foreign Secretary in 1947, speaking to James Brin, American, one of the American uh, Deputy Secretaries of State at this point. <clears throat> 
you would not let Negroes inform your policy, would you? Or one of them have the right to become president. Ironic, when I was writing the book, Obama was president. But crucially, this worked. The State Department was like, oh yeah, of course, of course, of course, of course. I mean, for instance, our Negroes in Alabama would never be able to mount a rebellion on this scale. Of course, this makes sense. It must be a Stalinist conspiracy. This is not the most aggressive racism, but it is a, a racist assumption that makes these arguments believable. In this case, a very old story of Orientalism. That seems obvious in 1947 in Vietnam, should not have existed in the Libyan case, and yet it did. Most of the writing on the Libyan case was essentially the same as 1830s discourses about North Africa. Whenever we speak of chaos, women, need to, women that need to be protected. As I said earlier, whenever we see women in diplomacy, gender being treated like this in diplomacy, we are really looking at a claim about nature, which brings us back to race, because the two always go hand in hand. Ideas of their nature. A lot of the French and Obama discourse about North Africa was about North Africa needing to be saved and needing to be helped so that democracy can happen and to be brought into modernity. Very classic Edward Said, you are back, you're always behind us in development and modernity joining us means going forward and going better. Um, this is not a commentary on the goals of the rebels in the Arab Spring, rather a commentary on how we saw it and how our diplomatic establishments made terrible mistakes because of these old and unnecessary ideas about nature, gender, and crucially, old stories of our relationship with these parts of the world. Now, a final comment I want to make is that whenever we hear comments that are gendered or are stereotypized, as Nanda Bo says, they do this, they do that. We are also looking at an older vice of diplomacy that I'm not sure can be resolved. Diplomacy in its current form was mostly shaped in the 19th century, the 19th century when ideas of ethnogeopolitics were dominant in Europe, when, when Bismarck's realpolitik and the cold appreciation that international relations is a struggle between races and nations for survival meant that the state is a nation and the nation is essentially behaves like a race. I wonder, is the permanence of these problems in diplomatic knowledge production perhaps a sign that these ideas are still at the basis of how diplomacy connects to nation and as the state's representative? I think there is some of that and it also is something that changes periodically as ideas of identity change and nationalism, uh, shall we say the balance of nationalism in our political economy moves around. But I'm going to stop there and uh, open for questions, because I think otherwise I'm, I'm in danger of rambling too far. Great. Thank you so much, Pablo. I've got tons of questions. I feel mm -hmm. like we need a bottle of wine to have a have a good detailed conversation about yeah. particularly, yeah, the, the, the legacies and endurance of racial and gendered logics that we think are debunked, but continue to resurface and bubble over. I mean, I'm also reminded of um uh, Franz Fanon's a dying colonialism right and how he writes how the west had you know in 1958 imagined um Algeria at that time and the gendered and racial dynamics and if you didn't know the year you would think that that is uh 2021 again yeah. how you know these these enduring kind of racial and gendered tropes and how we understand people and other people right um you know well, and they're so deeply embedded in our institutions so in yeah. this, this yeah. is just an example of these ideas having been around forever and therefore they color everything yeah yeah and the, you know projection of who Gaddafi is but also like you are hinting at a production of who we are right the the civil the light right the saviors and how that you know can is implicit in 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 these reproductions as well too i mean i encourage everyone listening to go to google right now and type on Google image search, um, Sarkozy, Cameron, and, um, and Jibril, who was the leader of the, the rebels at the time. They've got this heroic, you know, we're liberating Libya photo, all three of them congratulating themselves in Benghazi. It's exactly that, it's this white savior nightmare. And it's, in the case of France, it was so deeply, you know, this is our doorstep kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I like, so is, if there's anyone who has questions, please either raise your Zoom hand or, or put it in the chat box and we can, 
have a, a pick Pablo's brain more fur further, right? Um, and while I guess we're waiting, I just wonder, I mean, you raise a tension here between Clinton wanting to control the story, right? Um, and, and then the, the, the art of diplomacy is about, you know, forensically details, right? Getting the knowledge and getting enough detail of knowledge to hopefully inform wise policy. That's the intent of it. But it seemed in this practice, that's not what Clinton wanted. Uh, and I wonder, is this a tension that you can overcome, right? Between kind of what policy objectives are of what, because I don't think Clinton's an idiot in that regard, mm -hmm. right? Um, but she clearly made a conscious decision here to run with a particular narrative that she mm -hmm. felt was important for her, right? Um, despite uh, what you know, the broader intel might have been might have been leading to. That seems to be. Can you can you see that as a is that attention that uh, you know is 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 this maybe a one off exception? I like to probably think it's probably not. But how mm. how is that tension resolved for you? Or do you think it, that it can't be? It can't be. This is a problem that was highlighted 40 years ago in one of the seminal texts on um, uh, White here in the UK, you know, Diplomatic Investigations book, between, at the moment of the death of the king, diplomacy is placed in an impossible position because diplomacy was, was designed to represent a king or at most a republic run by six men in the case of Machiavelli's diplomacy, right? That is the basis of modern diplomacy. And so when you no longer have a king, Diplomacy is placed in an awkward situation by democracy. In fact, diplomacy still works like the diplomacy of the king. They still speak of we and a single will. Um, that was resolved a lot by nationalism in the 19th century, where we meant we, Britain, have a natural interest. Uh, realism still owes to that idea of natural interests, right, that, are, that you can see because they're not they're natural. Democracy gives us the paradigm that Clinton had the right to make specific choices as to how to see the world, and what to do about it because they won an election with a mandate to run foreign policy, right? Mm -hmm. So it is important to, to allow politics a share in diplomacy because also let's not pretend that diplomacy is unpolitical, as I was saying earlier. Uh, it, the institutions are riven with 300 years of quite dreadful ideas. No, 500 years. You would not believe how much Christian crap there's left over in diplomacy from the 1600s and, and how much Protestant crap, you would not believe the kind of things that British diplomats still have to say in some of the more formal moments, you know, because we, we hate Catholicism and we're fighting it all over the world still, right? And so this is a tension that I'm not sure can be resolved for two reasons. On the one hand, because a democratic mandate does mean um, that Biden should not have the same foreign policy as that left to him by Trump, because it is a mandate for political change, that's the whole point. On the other, I'm not sure the other stress can be resolved, which is if you choose to see something and you have been put at the head of these large institutions, you can make the institutions show you what you want to see mm -hmm. or not show you what you want to see. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not sure this stress can be resolved. Uh, I have now seen several locations, several locations of major political leaders. A very interesting example in the case of Vietnam was British Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevan, that when he realized that Britain was about to face a massive insurrection in Malaya, he said, we need the Americans to help the French in Vietnam, because even though it's bullshit, and that he actually said this, even though it's rubbish, that the Viet Minh are Stalinist stooges, this will help set up for America to help us in Malaya even when. Mm. And so he tells two British diplomats in Saigon, find me the evidence. The diplomats replied, there isn't any. British Foreign Secretary writes back to them saying, I'm told by the French Foreign Secretary that this committee within the Viet Minh League, the Viet Minh is, was the Vietnamese League for Independence, Vietnam Dot Lap Dom Minh Hoi, uh, is actually a communist Stalinist cell controlling the whole party. Um, these guys go and research this group. It turns out it's actually a governing group. It's a Politburo, but it's not necessarily Stalinist. Um, and they write this. And Ernest Bevan writes back saying, write it again, literally said write it again. Um, and they wrote it again saying, the French tell us this. And then by the time it, it gets analyzed in London, the committee is a Stalinist cell controlling the Vietnamese on behalf of the Soviet Union. Um, despite the fact that the entire foreign office disagreed with this and the diplomats kept refusing to write these things. Um, 
you because they are your employees. And Spevin was Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, and it was his prerogative to make him make them see it. Right? I don't think it was that clear with Clinton. With Clinton, it was more of a print me this one, don't print me the 30 pages yeah. about how the rebels are just a lot nastier than we think. It was a, a case of choosing not to see it. And the problem is that this is a natural problem to occur in a context where Clinton could not possibly have read everything. Yeah. Couldn't have. It's not humanely possible. I mean, it, it took me about a month and a half to get through in detail all, you know, all 5,000 pages of all the emails, only the emails related to this. So there's not a chance she could have in two weeks looked at everything. No, she could only direct how it was looked at. Mm -hmm. You have, um, so Inga would like to ask a question live and then um, can you see the question? Yes, 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 I just saw it in the chat. Okay, great. So while you're reading um, Romy's question, Inga, did you want to ask your question to Pablo live? Hey, yes, sure, I can do that. Shall, shall I go now or just? No, no, please, please, Inga, now. Uh, so yeah, thanks so much for your talk, Pablo. Um, so I, I've been working quite a lot on post-2011 Libya, right? So uh, this was interesting for me to see and the research angle you took, uh, definitely also really enlightening. I'm going to put a few points out there that uh, at least arguments I make, and then I think my question makes a bit more sense. Mm -hmm. So um, for my research, I would actually question that the or the revolts at least in 2011 were, were Islamist or Salafi led, to be honest. Like um, I would say they mobilized much more along regional, uh, like regional lines, local constituencies even, like it was very granular actually. Um, and the Islamists actually took quite a bit to catch up on uh, what was developing, mm -hmm. which of course then plays a role, especially when it comes to international support and mobilizing armed support, etc. However, I would also say that most of the Islamists and Salafis in the country in Libya at the point of 2011 would be what I would call something like reformed Islamists or something like Belhaj, Abdel Wahab Gai, they've all been through reconciliation programs, et cetera, et cetera. And to support my argument, after the fall of Gaddafi, we also saw Libya at least on a trajectory to a democracy where most of these guys all participated. And then the third point, um, Gaddafi and Salafism and Islamism, um, I would actually say he encouraged radical Salafis like the quietest Salafi Matralis, et cetera, that during the revolution, he put out statements with his son supporting these, et cetera. So now my question is, Giving this my points a bit, and then giving that you focused on all of the um, American diplomatic cables, et cetera, and we all know how obsessed the US was with the war on terror ever since, well, yes, 2001. Couldn't it be that the questions that were asked and the pushback that you see in terms of like, are these Islamists or Salafists, oh, we don't want to hear that, actually gets perpetuated by the US's obsession with the question of if these guys are Islams and Salafis? Like they wouldn't ask, oh, tell me more, are these uh, Suleiman tribes from the south are actually more true of like rebels? Or yeah, these were fala led Benghazi initiatives or Gaddafi tribes are also involved. Does that make sense? So yeah, really that, like it makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'll, I'll answer your question first and then okay. comment back on Islamism. Um, I'm not trying to say that we're all, all Al Qaeda. I'm, I'm trying to say that American diplomats knew quite well who we're talking about. Um, and they knew quite well also that this was the post Al Qaeda era in Islamism, mm -hmm. um, and especially in North Africa, groups that have now, parts of them joined Al Murabi tomb and so on and so forth. So it, it was, in, in hindsight, it was actually a pretty good judgment to understand them as problematic, not least because the US had been collaborating for years and repressing them with Gaddafi. As to Terror or not terror, this is also a catastrophe of good intentions, um, in the sense of there was a great deal of a good intention of we must stop seeing terrorists everywhere. <laughs> uh, it may well be that this turned around a little bit too far in two ways. One, because we knew more about these groups than was let on. What I meant about um, the revolt and the representation of the revolt, if you look at the representation of the revolt, Inga, they only look at the protesters in cities. That's it. There was no mention anywhere of any rebels being armed. Yeah, it, that was entirely uh, abstracted. 
entirely abstracted. And in fact, uh, it only became very, very clear just how armed these groups were in the in subsequent months, and then the Benghazi consulate nightmare, and so on and so forth. Um, I, I agree that Gaddafi did support some Salafists, some that were close to him, just like he supports some Tuareg groups and not others. Um, and you know, supported Polisario for a couple of years, and then um, you know, dumped them. Um, I think uh, uh, I'm not sure that the relationship was that clear as Gaddafi versus Salafists or the other way around. It really, really wasn't. It was engagement with some and others. And that's what I meant earlier about Gaddafi's very, very important and pivotal role and perhaps underappreciated until his death in holding together several different groups. Um, he was the accidental male holding together many, many strings from falling apart in North Africa. And this should have been taken into consideration. The problem that um, we also know in quite a lot of detail, and by we, I mean the diplomats that I've studied, knew in quite a lot of detail, uh, for instance, other dimensions. So a key dimension of this revolution was also Arab supremacism against all the nomads. And we're not talking not just about the Tuareg, many others as well, the Berabish and others. Um, and a key feature of the revolution post Gaddafi's death was actually a lot of racism against the nomads and the, the Salafists would rather um, use a more ISIS-like argument of they're basically uh, Sufi pagans, you know, and um, they need to be reformed. Um, and this is a stress that I'm not sure Gaddafi was able to, to resolve, but he held it at bay because he controlled so many of these groups, either as mercenaries, as allies, or just paid them off to shut up. Um, you know, the, one of the main lead, early leaders of the Tuareg rebellion, Bahanga, was someone that basically Gaddafi had contained, cajoled, paid off, imprisoned, trained. Gaddafi essentially dealt with these guys however he could. I'm not sure it was a very good relationship, but it was catastrophic upon the fall of his regime to see many of the rebels turn um, against these guys. And finally, going back to the question of seeing what we want to see, I think in many ways, Clinton made exactly the mistake she was trying to avoid. I think there were good intentions in we must not see paranoid terrorism everywhere, right? Um, but I think the complete opposite, wanting to just see freedom fighting, you know, as if this was the rebellion against the English crown may have been a step too far. And that's why my lesson is not that either of them is wrong as much as if there is simplicity in understanding these things, and I think that that's what you were trying to tell me by giving me detail of the groups on the ground, if, the, if it looks simple, it's probably not. Um, and you know, my main critique really is against simplifying the situation all the way to Gaddafi the madman versus freedom fighting unarmed rebels. And unarmed matters a lot because unarmed is the language that um, makes the biggest impact in the Security Council the resolutions that allowed for this. So we have expressing concern and so on and so forth. Um, but essentially, the only armed characters in the Security Council resolutions, which I analyze in a lot of detail, um, are all unarmed. And that's just not true. That's not to say that they were good or bad, but there was an armed rebellion against Gaddafi, a pretty big one. Um, and essentially, that was willingly ignored, even though they knew, they knew on the ground. And that's why Anne-Marie Slaughter is so important. Anne-Marie Slaughter tells Clinton, literally, do not speak of an armed rebellion. These are unarmed protesters, freedom for, fighting for freedom against a tyrant. And Clinton goes on to use that language all, and it makes it all the way into the UNSC resolution. Um, so we've got more questions in the chat. I should address them now quickly. Uh, do, 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 do. do I see the five lessons played part in the Trump administration? I, I mean, to be perfectly honest, Trump, so administration is was very very incoherent diplomatically because it was treated essentially as a business, and whatever can be had in short term gain is worth whatever short long term concession in North Africa. This is particularly obvious in the flip flopping that you mentioned um, in your comment. I think a more obvious example is Trump giving essentially Western Sahara recognition of their conquest of Western Sahara to Morocco in exchange for Morocco. Um, opening a short, a small mission, not a full embassy in Jerusalem. Um, so essentially a very long-term issue was treated for short-term gain. Um, that will pr probably not pay off at all, if ever. The consequences for North Africa are catastrophic, however. Um, summarize the five lessons very quickly, okay? Um, take diplomatic work seriously. <laughs> 
thousands of pages being written of a lot of good information worth reading. Two, who is doing diplomatic knowledge production and processing it and, and governing it? So for instance, the nightmare that insights like Inga's did not make it to Clinton's desk. Th those are a nightmare, those insights, those nuances. They knew they could have ended up on her desk. Yeah, and it's not just her fault, it's the establishment needs to work this better and use this information better. I mean, to be perfectly honest, most diplomats agree with me that yeah, their work should be used better, could be used better. I've had many diplomats tell me, oh my God, you take the diplomatic cables more seriously than basically the entire top strata of the foreign office. Um, three, this process of knowing who and why we're doing things internationally is much more than diplomatic, it's much more than official, it's personal, it's private, it can also be intimate, yeah, in some cases, it can even be the kitchen table, yeah, um, and crucially, you must always assume everyone wants in, everyone wants to tell you how to see something, because that, of course, shapes how you will deal with it. Lesson number four, big, vague strategies are a disaster. Global fight on communism, global fight on terror, they are liable to be abused because anyone can be made to look like that enemy. Um, and finally, lesson number five, old problems. A lot of old problems, racism, gender, but also the very problem of what is the state? Is the state a nation? Does the state have natural interests? A lot of diplomacy still speaks in the case of that. And that was the influence of a generation of real politique, um, diplomatic leaders, the likes of Kissinger and so on, that made it very energetic the case. And it made the, and very energetically the case that there are natural interests for countries determined by nature and so on and so forth. Um, any more questions? I mean, I got a question, but I think we're running out of time. That was more of the, you hinted to it at in, in your book chapter, but the influence of the private in the security industry and private industry itself um, and how that impacts how diplomacy and knowledge production is being done too, so. There is something small worth saying about this. And this matters a lot because right now, the guy that was responsible for a lot of this private information going into the State Department, what is now National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan. Jake Sullivan very often would legitimize a lot of the information coming in from more private and informal sources like Blumenthal, essentially by getting Blumenthal to buy reporting from think tanks, from private security firms and things like that, and then including them into the process of diplomatic knowledge production. That's what I was saying, that we need to grow up in our view of diplomacy. This is not Ferrero Rocher and all typewriters. It is that, but it is also wives, gossip, uh, you know, a cleaner saying, hey, I've got a tribal contact, we let me speak to him. Boom, suddenly we realize why the Tuareg in Southern Libya are so pissed off. Literally because of a random contact with the cleaner that makes it all the way to the political advisor. But no one in Washington, cares, essentially. Um, there is a lot of the personal. So I think Clinton, for instance, was more influenced than we would like to think by a very, very simplistic understanding of humanitarianism in this relationship with democracy. Mm. Very, very simplistic. And it seems to me that a lot of the thinking that went around, uh, you know, the time, uh, the, the, the Campbell era of understanding the Bosnian war and so on, and, and Clinton's view of this war, I think there's a lot of rethinking as to the long-term effects of this on all politicians. Politicians carry their stories into um, their roles and that's inevitable, right? Um, can I say another important inference was, how to say this, Clinton's own idea of how to do feminism as Secretary of State. This also mattered. This mattered, for instance, in her relationship with Anne-Marie Slaughter. And so, wanting to see it that way did not necessarily resolve it. Um, interestingly, <laughs> the reason I criticize her feminism is because for Clinton in many of her emails, and th this is very obvious, and these are quite fun to look at if you just uh, search, if you go to the Podesta emails in, in the WikiLeaks database and you go into the plus D version, which is the searchable one, and then you search her and women, essentially just her emails that mention women. Very often the solution to women in diplomacy is herself. <laughs> I'm secretary of state, it's all fine now. Uh, you know, if they let me do what I want, that is feminism. Um, so the two, the, the person becomes the cause, but this is a phenomenon that happens in all politics. I think Trump is the most obvious, the person is the cause and no more. Um, but in a lot of politics, this has long been true, or sometimes the person becomes attached to the cause or to a specific side of the cause. 
which is why I go back to, I wonder, we, we can only speculate. That's why I study text because I don't like to speculate as to what people think, you see. Yeah, I think Cynthia Enlo also wrote a book, highlighted, you know, Clinton more than any other um, Secretary of State on her international visits would have off the books meetings with women's groups in local, you know, um, context to get more informal discussions. We don't know how that fed into her policy or beliefs, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's attention. She's bringing women and women issues in, you know, onto the floor, but as you said, it's very much conditioned by her own imagining of what feminism is and yeah. what possible so i think it's even fair to say that we can see the impact of her generation's feminism as opposed to ours right and and their methods and approaches one last question from martin walker a very good question uh cia product there was quite a lot of it mm. and it was almost entirely ignored cia product was essentially what inga was enlightening us about there are these groups and these many many complex groups and they have these different relationships and they're Many of them are armed to the teeth, and these guys have been waiting to kill Gaddafi for 40 years. You know, we knew quite a lot. Uh, again, ignoring, but ignoring the CIA is a political sport in Washington these days. Um, I mean, Trump had, did it even more aggressively, but it, he wasn't the first. The CIA's first ever mission, ever, ever, was in late 1946. It's detailed in my book, The Road to Vietnam, was working out how communist are the Vietnamese rebels? Are they really Stalinist stooges? And they persecuted uh, what, what the French claimed was a group of Russian advisors traveling through China to Vietnam. Turns out there were seven Russian tramps that had run away from a, a gulag. They were not Russian advisors going to Vietnam uh, and they found no evidence whatsoever. But that too was ignored. Gosh, I mean, um, Pablo, you're just an amazing speaker. Um, it's it's lovely to hear you talk and tell the stories that you do. Um, you know, uh, analytical sophistication and rigor with entertainment, right? So you've got, <laughs> you've got that brilliant lectureship um, um, balance that, that we all strive for. So I want to thank you so much for being a part of our New Voices seminar series. Um, and for sharing your research, your, you know, and then fingers crossed, we'll, we'll have you back when your book comes out again to talk more deeply. Oh yeah, absolutely. I would love that. Um, Amanda, thank you. That, that I have to intervene because that was the compliment I never knew I needed. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. It's been great. Uh, I hope you, you enjoyed it and um, email me if you want to see the chapter. Uh, yep. Absolutely. And then please also final shout out to Pablo's going to have a blog post in the okay. Affairs Chatham House series, New Voices um, series based upon his talk, but also cool insights about where he's going forward. With this. So check that out. That will be released in uh, mid-April. Mm -hmm. uh, so watch this space. And again, thank you audience for coming and asking some pretty cool questions. And Pablo, thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.